Next up, we have a women's strawweight bout at 115 pounds between two American fighters, Jin Yu Fry and Hannah 24K Goldie. Goldie 6-2 overall, 3-2 in her last five fights. Slight dog here at plus 155 in the money line. She's based out of Tampa, Florida, 29 years old. 5-4 and 5 61 inch reach. She trained out of UFC Gym Winter Springs. As for Fry, 11 and 6 overall, 3-2 in her last five fights. A slight favorite here at minus 180 the money line. She's out of Arlington, Texas, 36 years old. 5 foot 3 in height with 65 inch reach, out of Genesis BJJ. So height and reach wise, got a 1 inch advantage there in height for Goldie, but a 4 inch advantage there in uh, reach for Fry. And if you've watched Hannah Goldie fight before, she's jacked. She's really jacked, but she's got those T-Rex arms. So that's why her reach is a little bit shorter. And looking at the numbers on Tapology, Jin Yu Fry is the favorite at 75%. Only 25% of the votes coming in for Goldie. A little surprise. You know, Hannah Goldie is a contributor to the OnlyFans community. And uh, she's all over the gram and whatnot, kind of showing the flesh. I would imagine she would have had a little more support here on Tapology, but whatever. I am also on Fry to win. I'm going to try to break it down for you as quick as possible. I promised myself I wouldn't spend too much time in this fight. But as you know, here at MMA Fight Club, we have uh, we have an addiction to doing the deep dive, right? We just can't help ourselves but start digging into the background and looking at the background of the fighters and giving you the most information possible. So with that said, let's jump into it. So Jin Yu Fry, she's landing 2.86 strikes per minute, absorbing 4.06. Yeah, not great ratio there. She's absorbing almost two more strikes per minute than she's dishing out. Eh, more like 1.25. Anyway, the point is the number's negative. For Hannah Goldie, she's landing 6.05 strikes per minute, so a little busier, and absorbing 4.85. So just striking numbers alone looks better there for Hannah Goldie. For takedown offense, 0.78 takedowns per 15 minutes for Jin Yu Fry, so not a very active wrestler, and 0.61 for Hannah Goldie. When you look at Hannah Goldie, you're thinking, oh, she must be a wrestler, must be a grappler. In her last fight, she had an armbar win in first round, but she doesn't really do that very much. I'm not sure if that's going to be an evolution in her game. Will she you know, add that more in her game? You know, Considering that she's got those shorter arms and she's not a very good striker, not technically very good, you can imagine if she wants to stay in the UFC game or stay in the mixed martial arts game altogether, she's going to have to get better at the grappling and start increasing those takedown numbers. Now for takedown defense, Hannah Goldie's at 50% and Jin Fry's at 90%. But again, I don't imagine that that's going to be tested for either fighter unless it's sort of like a scramble, fall to the ground. For Hannah Goldie, I believe her path to victory, though, is going to have to be somewhere on the ground because on the feet, she's limited. And we'll go talk more about it. But on the ground, again, last fight, armbar win. Now looking at the background information of the two fighters. Let's talk about Jin Yu Fry first. She's Korean American. Her father was Korean. Her mother's American. Unfortunately, her father passed away when she was very young. She was born in Arkansas, but raised in Texas. She's a former Adam Weight champion in Invicta. And just a little side note: when she was in Invicta, she went five rounds on three different fights. So she's been the distance many times. She's got good cardio. She grew up in Texas, as I mentioned before. She was top two percent of her high school class. Okay, whatever high school, whatever you know. What do you make of that? But she was a good student, right? From there, she goes on to get her associate's degree in nuclear medicine at Amarillo College. Okay, associate's degree, whatever. From there, she transfers to Midwestern State University where she gets her bachelor's degree in radiological sciences. She's not done yet. From there, she goes on to get her MBA, her master's in business administration from the University of Texas. So she is very, very educated. She has something to fall back on when she's done. It just speaks to the kind of person she is. A high character, very educated, comes from obviously a mixed cultural background. She's married to Douglas Frey. She's got a BJJ purple belt. One and two as an amateur. She went pro 2013, nine year pro career. She fought in Invicta and Ryzen prior to signing with UFC. She signed with the UFC 2020. She started off in the UFC with two straight losses, but then she put together two straight wins. So she's two and two in the UFC. Her most notable opponents, she fought Gloria DePaula, who just fought last weekend. She won that fight by decision, 2021, just last year. She lost to Kay Hansen in 2020 by a round three triangle choke. And that would be one of the chinks in the arm here for, oh, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> that sounds completely like, um, that's that's inappropriate. You never you should never say chink in the armor when you're referring to someone who's of Asian descent. So please forgive me on that. I'm going to leave this here. I'm not going to cut this out. I apologize. I would never say that in some kind of a racial way. What I'm specifically saying for her is one of the weaknesses in her game could be the triangle choke, could be submissions. Virginia Fry here, and you can see that she's been submitted before in the past. So just something to consider. She also fought Ashley Yoder 2021 and won that fight by decision. And notably in that fight, you know, Ashley Yoder, whatever, she's, you know, a middling fighter, about 500 level winning percentage. But in that fight, you can see the punching power of Virginia Fry, and she punches pretty good. She's got nice straight punches, and she was able to tag her a few times. The things I like about Virginia Fry. Very busy fighter. She fought two times last year and three times in 2020. So five times in the last two years. And she's fighting here early in 2022. You like to see that. And at 36 years old, she's very, very busy. She's a balanced fighter, meaning that she doesn't do anything great. She's okay on the feet, probably better than most. On the ground, you know, serviceable. And she's jacked, by the way. I keep hearing people say, oh, Hannah Goldie's jacked. Jin Yu Fry is pretty jacked, too. Like, she's pretty strong. Not as jacked as Hannah Goldie, which we'll talk about. But she's definitely strong. Excellent cardio, and she's been a distance, like I said, several times. She's also a southpaw, so just keep that in mind. Hannah Goldie's got deficiencies on that stand-up game, both with defense and boxing. Now she's going against a southpaw. If Goldie stays on the feet for three rounds, Jin Yu Fry wins this fight easy. 
Easy, easy, easy. One more thing about Junior Fry, her stand-up defense, like her boxing defense is pretty good. Watch her fight. She's pretty good. Good head movement. She uses her hands to avoid punches. She doesn't just sit there and, you know, use her guard to block punches. She's pretty good. Pretty good head movement. Not elite level striker or elite level boxer, but she's better than Hannah Goldie. I only have a few concerns with Junior Fry. She's not a big finisher, right? So seven of her last eight fights have gone to decision. She's a lot like Goldie in that she can be a little robotic at times. Now, not as robotic as Goldie, but just because of the physique, right? You know, you can, like the muscly, you know, you know, that kind of physique. You just can't move as well because you got these freaking muscles like Misha Serkinov. I'm not also sure about Junior Fry's durability. Okay, so for example, she's been finished by TKO twice and she got finished by a triangle choke. That's three fights she's lost. She hasn't fought a lot of fights. So you got to, you know, keep that in mind that she has been finished. I'm not sure about the durability. Some background information on Hannah Goldie. Her real name is not Goldie. All right. Her real name is Hannah Eliza Goldschmidt. I'm not sure why she dropped the Goldschmidt. I believe that's Jewish. It's very common for Jewish people to drop the Schmidt, the burger, um, that part of their name, house and whatever, just because of, I don't know, but I think she likes the last name Goldie. So now she's rolling with Goldie, but I did notice in one of her prior fights, I believe it was the fight against, oh, it just, it skips my mind. But one of her recent fights during the, during the broadcast, you could hear like John Anik or someone being like, her name on the side of her pants says Goldschmidt, but I don't understand why that's the case. Is that her real name? Yeah, dude, it's on Wikipedia. Just look it up. Her real name is Hannah Eliza Goldschmidt and she's from Vermont. She grew up snowboarding, running cross country. So she was an athlete. Nothing with mixed martial arts, like no wrestling background, nothing with combat sports. But then when she's living in Manhattan in 2014, she goes with her father to a fight night event, a boxing fight night event in Manhattan, and she just falls in love. She's like, I want to become a combat sports fighter. I want to get into this. And so she does it. She's a big contributor to OnlyFans. So if you're one of the people that are on her OnlyFans, you know, I, I guess I don't know what that involves. I'm not one of the people that would subscribe to that kind of stuff. Married, happily married. I got my, only, my OnlyFans is in my bedroom. You know what I mean? She has a son with a fellow MMA fighter, Alex Nicholson. She was 3-1 as an amateur. Her most notable opponent that she fought to date was Diana Belbita. They fought last year. She lost the fight by decision. That fight, if, if you want to see what I'm talking about, she, her guard is, is poor. So I'm trying to explain this. Hannah Goldie is so freaking jacked that I don't think she could put her elbows together. Like, she couldn't do that. There's no way. Her arms are really short, and she's jacked. So she stands like this. Like, that's just normal posture for her. Like, for her to do this would require, like, she can't do it. She just can't do it. The shoulders are so muscly. The arms muscly. As the fight's going on and she's standing like this, all you have to do is just right down the chute, man. She didn't fight all day, right down the chute. And Belbita, you know how she fights, right? Right down the chute. Belbita cracked her ass, knocked her down, almost finished her in round one. If Belbita was smarter about her fighting and not falling into the guard and getting on the ground and keeping the distance, she could have finished her in round one. And look, it's not a big deal. Belbita's a decent fighter. I'm just saying in this fight here, I see Jin Yu Fry doing that to her because her guard is poor. Her arms are out here. Her boxing is very poor. She's not a lethal striker. You know, it just sets it up for a disaster for her against anybody who's a decent striker, which is why I keep saying for Hannah Goldie to evolve and stay in the UFC or be relevant in mixed martial arts, she's going to have to get better at the ground game just based upon her build. Some things I do like about Hannah Goldie. She was active last year. She fought two fights. Now, she didn't fight at all in 2020. She has a son. I'm going to speculate maybe that's when she was having her son. I'm not sure. And by the way, if she had a kid in 2020, that girl is ripped, man. She's in great shape. Good for her to bounce back and have such a great physique. Her finishing ability, not really sure, but she does have a nice first round armbar finish last year over Whitmire, but I'm not really sure. I'm not sure if that's going to become part of her arsenal. Was that a one-time thing? Was Whitmire just being silly? In the fight versus Whitmire, Whitmire gets into an armbar situation and then comes out of it, but then goes right back into the guard and like ends up getting armbar. Like, idiot. All right, my concerns with Hannah Goldie. She's lost two of her last three fights, one to Belbita and one to Granger. She's got a very stiff fighting style and a very stiff posture. I don't know who to compare it to, but you know what I'm talking about. Those people that are just so freaking jacked that they can't move. And it exists in all sports. There's basketball players like this. There's football players like this. The people just don't have good movement. And you see it. Her movement is very robotic. So there's nothing fluid. And at times, what she'll do is like she'll try to reset. When I say reset, what she'll do is like trying to bounce on her feet. You know, the fighters are like trying to loosen up. Like, okay, I'm going to loose. She'll do that between exchanges, but then as soon as the exchange starts, she just tightens back up and everything gets tight and everything's like, Ugh, and she's like, Ugh, and everything's like, you see it. Like everything is tight. Like she starts getting really tight. Her punches are tight. Everything's robotic and there's no fluid movement. Like I would say compare, let's say Muhammad Ali, right? Muhammad Ali was a very fluid striker, rope a dope. And then you have George Foreman. <clears throat> Like that's her style, but unfortunately as a woman, as a woman at this weight class, she doesn't have the power that George Foreman does, does, has not shown the knockout power and her arms are really short. I don't see where Hannah Goldie goes from the, from here in the future of her mixed martial arts career, unless she starts to really grapple. She's going to have to get better there. 
I'm sure her coaches are working on it. In the last fight, she showed that with the armbar. That's going to have to be something that's going to become more and more part of her arsenal because when she's on her feet, she's stiff, robotic, easy to hit. And you can just see it. Like you can see as a fighter when you're watching her that she's trying to set herself to relax, but she can't relax. It's just not in the DNA. The fights we watched to bring down this film, we watched Goldie vs. Belbita in 2021, Goldie vs. Whitmire last year as well, and Jin Yu Fry vs. Yoda in 2021. Those three fights, as usual, as you know, you know the drill here. Those three links are in the description if you want to watch those fights on your own. The last few notes I have on the fighters, the side-by-side -side comparisons, experience-wise, I'm clearly giving edge to Jin Yu Fry. Okay, she's been on the earth longer, seven years, and she's fought more mixed martial arts fights. She's fought 17 to be exact, compared to only eight for Goldie. Has Jin Yu Fry, you know, fought amazing, you know, level of competition? No, but she is a former atomweight champion from Invicta. She's fought some decent opponents, you know, Ashley Yoder and a few other people that are at least notable names that you recognize. Whereas for Hannah Goldie, she's still kind of getting her feet wet. Only eight total fights. Fighter IQ, I gotta give the edge to Jin Yu Fry again because she's been in there with some better opponents and she shows a wide range of ability to, to fight someone. Hannah Goldie. He, she can't strike, and if she can't work, win the grappling battle, then she's up against it. Cardio, they both seem to be in great shape. There's nothing about Hannah Goldie that suggests to me that she's going to get tired. Now, her build looks like the, you know, Rodolfo Fiera, Misha Serkinov build, where they're all muscly, but I haven't seen her get tired. She seems to be light on her feet, tries to balance between exchanges and try to, you know, stay in the fight. Doesn't seem to get tired. And as for Jin Fry, we mentioned before, she's been in distance five-round fights three times while she was in Evicta. Boxing? Huge edge for Junior Fry. When I say huge, it's only because Hannah Goldie is so bad at boxing. Now, Junior Fry is not an elite level boxer, but she is pretty good. And I would say for any woman out there fighting, she's definitely better than the average girl because she's punching straight, straight on the pipe. It's pretty good technique. She doesn't overpunch herself, doesn't get off balance. So there's a big advantage there for Junior Fry in the boxing. Grappling, I'm going to give an edge to Hannah Goldie because of that last fight with the armbar win. That was impressive. It looked good. Maybe she's evolving in that area, but it's not like she's going to just overtake Jin Yu Fry. And I want to mention again, Jin Yu Fry is jacked too, okay? I know Hannah Goldie is more jacked, but the point is Jin Yu Fry is in great shape. She should be able to handle herself there, defend takedowns. And look, I'm being specific here, but Hannah Goldie, let's say she wants to get a double leg takedown, single leg takedown, or even just get a body lock. I don't think she can get her hands around her opponent. I don't think a body lock is even possible for her. Her arms are so freaking short, she would just be trying to get them together. It wouldn't happen. She's limited. I'm imagining she's going to use some type of judo sweeps or headlocks to try to bring her opponent to the ground or find her opponent off balance or like what happened against Belbita where Belbita just got overzealous and like fell into the guard. Anyway, regardless, I just find Hannah Goldie to be very limited as a fighter. I think she belongs in the UFC right now. She's she's opened up the last two cards, I believe, in the prelims. She's where she belongs. She's on a prelim card here. And maybe she kind of, you know, does a few things and evolves. But for right now, I've got my doubts. I think she's very limited. And just a side note, this is going to be me and my soapbox for a second here. I broke down the fight. You guys know how I went to win, but just a little uh, little epilogue here. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, you know, so I grew up in the inner city, had a chance to be around a lot of different cultures, you know, then I had a chance to be an athlete, went off to college and did all that. Had a chance to coach athletes. I had a chance to sponsor athletes. I've worked at different sports organizations. There's no question that the African-American athlete changed the game. I think it was um, Joe Paterno, right? Joe Paterno at Penn State, who one time during a... Uh, an infamous press conference said that but he said in a way where people misconstrued it like oh is that a racist comment like he was just you know, he's like listen the black athlete has changed the game we know that there used to be pro basketball in this country where blacks weren't allowed to play okay there was uh pro baseball where black athletes weren't allowed to play the color barrier you know uh roberto clemente we can go on and on with the athletes who've broke the color barrier we can go through on athletes like kareem abdul jabbar and and, and all these different guys who've had to deal with pushback from our country not allowing african-american athletes in the door you know where i'm going with this right if you've ever watched world star or just peruse the internet you know that african-americans have a side of them that let's just put it this way they enjoy combat so i'm gonna give you a little little you know example i used to coach college football for oh, seven eight years and i was a head coach for a junior college team for a while and I would go by the house to go visit the guys, the few houses that they had in town, just to make sure everything's okay. Hey, guys, how you doing? You know, it'd be a big house, like you know, seven, eight bedrooms, kind of like a dorm. And I'll come over on the weekend. Hey, guys, how you doing? Just stop by, check on the check on the boys, make sure they're not doing anything crazy. And it would be often I'd find them in the backyard with boxing gloves, <laughs> boxing, right? That's not a phenomenon. That's like a that's a common thing. Okay, you go to the urban parts of the world, or even just down south in Florida, not even urban. It's common for young African-American guys to go out back, put some gloves on and, for fun, and do some boxing or do some tap boxing. That's common. Just like you'll see mattresses in the ghetto where kids, young African-American kids, are flipping off mattresses in the ghetto. Why am I saying this? Because where would you see that in a white community? I live in a white community. I don't see white kids flipping off of, of mattresses over here in Newtown, Pennsylvania. 
I don't see uh, white kids in backyards with boxing gloves boxing. <laughs> I don't see white girls out there pulling weaves off each other's hair and fighting. And here's where I'm going with this. It's of my humble opinion, and I could be completely wrong, and it's not a racial thing, because I, I love all people. I love white, green, brown, black, yellow, whatever you are. I got love for everybody. Anyone who knows me personally, they know me. They know I don't have any, I don't see color, okay? But I do see results, and I'm a realist. The UFC is going to get overrun by black girls. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. Expect it. It's coming. Because once these young African-American athletes, people like Jamal Hill, who are coming out of Grand Rapids, the ones that are domestic. I'm not talking about guys that are coming from overseas. I'm not talking about Kamar Usman. Well, no, Kamar Usman is domestic. But the point, I'm not talking about like Francis Ngannou or Cyril Gan. Those are black people, yes. I'm talking about the American black athlete. The one from the inner city. The one from Grand Rapids, like Jamal Hill. The ones from LA. The ones from New York City. The ones from Florida. When you start opening the doors to those athletes, those young African-American athletes are going to run through people like Hannah Goldie. I mean, they have all due respect. Hannah Goldie belongs in the UFC right now. But Hannah Goldie won't be able to hold their towel. These young athletes that we're talking about that I'm not seeing yet, once they break that door to UFC, game over. Game over. You're going to see some high-profile athleticism in the women's division, especially when they let more black girls in. Now, I want to bring up the Shields girl, right? I forgot her first name. The Shields girl who fought in PFL and she's a boxer. I'm not talking about that. She's not a mixed martial artist. She's a boxer. And quite frankly, it's a little annoying they're trying to keep pushing her, pushing her to mixed martial arts because she has no business in mixed martial arts. She clearly is not training it. Stick to boxing. But once we could find a path, a pipeline to get inner city, matter of fact, UFC's putting what? The Shanghai uh, UFC Performance Institute in China. Put that shit in the Bronx. Okay? Put that shit in Compton. Okay? You ever heard of Serena Williams and Venus Williams? You know why they were so amazing? They're two African-American girls from Compton who exploded and dominated tennis. An all-white sport. All-white. All-white. You let a few black girls into the UFC, watch out. Hannah Goldie won't have any room in there. There won't be room for the girls like that. And I mean this because not ever out of disrespect for Hannah Goldie. She's a good athlete. But those short arms and that robotic stuff? No, 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 no. You put some of these young African-American athletes in there, a girl with the fluid hands, lights out. I got off my soapbox. I said it. It's uh, February of 2022, so about three or four years from now, when there's like a ton of young African-American girls making their way through UFC. You heard it first.